I sat down with Professor Louis Fox, visiting professor at the University of California, Berkeley, and former lead economist at the World Bank, where she worked for 30 years. We discussed Africa's informal economy and Africa's large youthful population. Africa is the second largest population in the world and the youngest continent in the world, with 50% of its population under the age of 19. Where do you think these young Africans are going to find jobs? And please define what we mean by jobs in the context of Africa. Well, I'm an economist, and so for me a job means an economic activity that is producing goods that people might want to buy, even if they don't buy them. So if I'm growing food for my family, I'm engaged in an economic activity even though I'm not selling the goods, I'm just making dinner with them, right? Uh, if I didn't make them, I'd have to buy them. Okay, so, so that's the first thing. Anybody producing or engaged in producing a good and service that somebody might transact for, buy, um, that's a job. Um, and that also includes uh, fetching water, since you might pay for water uh, as well. Um, now, uh, so what are young Africans going to do? Well, I would say for the next 10, 20 years, they're probably going to do many of the things that their parents did. Mm -hmm. But the question is, can they do them smarter and better and make more money at it? Because that's what it's really about. Mm -hmm. Can they make more money at it and have a better standard of living? So, um, as you know, my estimates suggest that, um, especially in the lower income countries, uh, many Africans will end up not in a, a firm, not in an enterprise, not in the government, but in a household business or a household farming activity or a combination of the two. So the real challenge for governments today and for the countries today and for the youth of those countries today is can they find opportunities to do them better and make more money at them. Uh -huh. and can governments either help them with that or get out of the way uh -huh. so they can do it. So uh, Louis, I find it hard to understand this concept of uh, household uh, industries. Is, is that the same as the informal economy that uh, most people talk about? In yes, Africa? pretty much, pretty much. It doesn't include informal wage labor, but uh -huh. it includes people working for themselves and their families. It includes the people in the market selling stuff, it includes the people cutting hair at home, it includes the people repairing stuff, it includes the people transforming uh, the food, that the, the, their own production in a simple way. Um, so making beer, making food that they sell, make, uh, you know, toasting cassava or making bread or, you know, whatever. But it's also small scale manufacturing. Uh, and services. I mean, where, after all, do most Africans get services? They don't go to the shopping mall and get their hair cut. They get it on the streets. They get it on the streets, or if they're in the village, they get it in the village. That's true. And that's what's so interesting is, you know, uh, for example, Nigeria just tried to enumerate them and in the process said, look, we're, we have a lot more GDP, or le the level of our GDP is a lot higher than we thought. We're the biggest economy in Africa now that we've really counted what we're doing, including the food people are producing at home. That doesn't mean that, that didn't that fact didn't change the level of deprivation of the poor people in Nigeria. They're still poor and they're still deprived, whether they're enumerated or not. Mm -hmm. But they should be enumerated and they should be counted, and their progress should be counted as well. Mm -hmm. How can African governments and other stakeholders craft an employment policy for this youthful African population? Now, in the household enterprise sector, I think maybe people haven't paid as much attention to that sector. And there, I would say it's a matter of urban policy. It seems to me too many cities in Africa, especially capital cities, are really trying to be quote-unquote world-class cities, which is great, but, you know, you're not going to jump from... Um, you know, you're not going to jump to become Copenhagen in one generation, I always say. And if you look at cities in Asia, you see that um, the city planning is really 
uh, at least allowing and planning for uh, informal uh, activity and, and, and building markets for it and helping to build channels for it and helping to keep it going and keep it alive and knowing that not everybody gets their hair cut in the mall and knowing that people have to have places to do that. And I think in Africa the city planning is really trying to only plan for big, nice, clean enterprises and not realizing that it's going to take time and develop's gonna, development is going to be a, a, an uneven process and people are going to come to cities and people who are born in cities are going to live in cities and work in cities informally and that what has to be done is they have to be able to um, market their, their production, uh, sell their products and, and do things better and faster and easier and expand and that's about um, that's about microfinance, that's about um, mobile finance and mobile money, that's about public safety, um, that's about being able to move back and forth to the economic opportunity safely and cheaply. So that's about um, bus transportation for the masses, not uh, about private cars. It's about a lot of different things. Um, it's about an infrastructure to do business for the small guys not just for the big guys. And I think there, uh, it's about zoning, it's about access to a place to work, um, and I think there there may be some more, there needs to be more uh, thinking, uh, urban planning has to include that. There are some examples of mm -hmm. where it's been done well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in our book on youth employment in Sub-Saharan Africa, we talked about some examples from Ghana, for example, um, uh, where it had been done well, a lot of countries are thinking about industrial estates and industrial clusters. What's happening on the edge of that? Is there space for the small guys to be there? Bus routes. People are putting in bus routes. At the bus stops, are they also planning and zoning and making it legal for people to sell stuff? So as people get on and off the bus, they can buy stuff. Are they thinking about that? Or are they just thinking about a bus stop and then cleaning everybody out? Mm -hmm. That's really the question. This is a very open-ended question, and um, I, um, I encourage you to tackle it in whatever way you see necessary. Uh, what is the future of Africa? I know that's, that's a big one. I am not romantic about the life of a small farmer or a small businessman or woman in Africa at all. I am not romantic about it at all. It's a very hard life. It has deprivations that I would hope never to have to face. Uh, but it is what it is, and the question that we should be facing is not how to get rid of it, but how to make it better. Now, I think the future of Africa, the real challenge for Africa is to have a future of inclusive growth. If Africa is able to use its resources, um, and use its resources to bring up the living standards of everyone and bring up the assets of the households and the human capital and the health and the welfare. Um, that is a future that looks good. Um, that's a story about governance, about participation. One issue we haven't discussed about the young people of Africa is is there space for them to participate in creating this new Africa? Or is the gerontocracy that's been running Africa for a long time, and, and the presidents and the politicians who want to stay in for life, are they uh, uh, limiting that space? Mm -hmm. And I think um, the future of Af if the future of Africa is its young people, those young people have to have the space to make it, to make their future.